Thank you very much for coming, everybody. Uh, it's our first talk of, of this term, and we are really delighted to have here Sir Tony Brenton, who is a Cambridge alumnus. He did his degree here in math, and then worked in a foreign, foreign office for 30 years, and among other areas of his expertise was Russia. He served as the British, uh, the British ambassador to Moscow from 2004 to 2008, if I'm not mistaken. And he's going to give us a talk on uh, Russian relations, 1917 and 1991. Thank you very much. And Thank you so please much. Please welcome Tony Brenton. Don't do that. It's a huge mistake. It's like paying for a restaurant meal before you've actually eaten it. <laughs> I'd be very pleased if you, if you applaud me. Yeah. Um, do you mind if I take my jacket off? I, I, I like to wave my arms around and get... get yeah, is that okay? Okay. Um, as Sasha said, I'm uh, ex-British diplomat. I spent eight years living in Russia, one way or another. Um, and I'm now back here at Cambridge, and I've just produced a book. Well, when I say I produced it, I got other people to do the hard work. There it is. It's called Historically Inevitable. I actually edited it. It's a collection of chapters by much better known people than me, like Orlando Figes and um, Chai Levin and so on. Uh, the concept is, well, I need to start a little bit further back. The, um, the story about the Russian Revolution, of course, under communism, was that it was inevitable. That this, was the, that this was history, Marxist history, working itself out in the way that it was always going to do. Now, not very many people believe that anymore, but nevertheless, there's, there's, a, there's still a certain feeling about that somehow Russia was doomed to this revolution, was doomed to Lenin and all the awful things that happened to it. Um, and the point of the book, I've gotten 12, 13, 14 quite eminent historians, each to pick a moment in the revolution when things might have gone differently. Um, and to write a chapter which talks about what happened, but also talks a little bit about how history might have veered off in a different direction. And I might say a couple of words about that as we, as we go on, but that's not the main point of, of this lecture today. Um, as I did this, um, I got thinking about, first of all, the whole import of the 1917 revolution, which is now a long time ago. Its chief product, communism, is dead as a doornail, really. I was accused in a in a review in the, um, the London Review of Books of Western triumphalism in regard to communism. I was thinking about this a bit. It's a bit like being uh, insulted as being, uh, 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 being charged with round-earthism when you say that actually not many people believe anymore that the earth is flat. Um, an aside. But anyway, the, the point is that while I was thinking about the revolution and how it's gone into the past and a lot of its effects no longer way, I got thinking about the fact that Russia has had another revolution of a sort since, which was, of course, around the year 1991 with the collapse of communism. And the, the, the thought occurred to me to investigate whether there might be parallels between the two events. What are the comparisons? What do they tell us about Russia? What are the underlying features which they may or may not show with regard to Russian history? Uh, Hegel, as you all know, said that history is philosophy teaching by examples by which I think he meant that there's some underlying pattern there, and history gives us snapshots of it, and out of those snapshots you hope to discern the underlying pattern. And the question in my mind was, do these two snapshots, the 1917 revolution and the 1991 revolution, offer some insight into the way history works, at least as regards to Russia? And I'm gonna, my main aim is to gallop through uh, an account, first of all, of the 1917 revolution, then of the 1991 revolution, and then to try and draw out the differences and, and, and the parallels. So I'm going to make you work quite hard, I'm afraid, over, over the next hour. I've got 38 slides here. <laughs> I'll go through them as fast as I possibly can. So anyway, we, we, we move on hastily to uh, with the, the, the 1917 revolution. But of course, as you talk about these revolutions, you don't just talk about the date. You don't even talk about the few weeks around the date. These are events which come out of a historical situation and which lead to a historical situation. It's identifying the trajectory, which is the interesting part of looking at these revolutions. So we look at the 1917 revolution. There's an extreme, am I, I'm not shading the picture. Now. Um, this is, of course, a very well known picture of Tsar Nicholas II and his, his lovely family, his slightly shrewish wife Alexandra, the three delightful Tsarevne, and the uh, Tsarevich and uh, Alexis there at the bottom, who unfortunately suffers from haemophilia. Um, what is not very popular in history, as it is written and studied today, is taking a close interest in personality. There's a, a rather strong feeling that 
you know, the patterns are lie in the, the, the economics and the politics, and ordinary people don't matter very much. This was a man who mattered a lot. He's caught in his, in his best possible role. He was a very good family man. He really cared about being father to Alexis, being father to Zerevne, being husband to Alexandra, not that she gave him a lot of choice. Um, he was lousy at almost everything else. He, he was what we, we in, the, in, the, in the Foreign Office, used to call a, a cushion minister, which means he took on the shape of the last person who'd sat on him. He, he, he was petulant. He had no focus, he was disloyal to the best people who worked for him. He was exactly the wrong man to be Tsar of Russia when the crisis hit. But he was the, 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 the Tsar of Russia at the time the crisis hit. And the country he inherited, the country uh, from, from his, rather, his much bigger and tougher father, Alexander III, um, was a country which was, like, not the only country in Europe which had these problems, a big, disorganised, not very well run land empire with industrialising, not very fast. 80% of the people still live on the soil, are still peasants, are still very far from the, the big cosmopolitan centres, notably St. Petersburg and Moscow. Uh, a country which in a way is divided between this vast mass of mostly illiterate, mostly country dwelling people and a very, very thin western layer on top of them who rule the country. And a country which is changing quite fast as we did in the Industrial Revolution, as France did in its Industrial Revolution, as in parallel ways, Ottoman Turkey and uh, perhaps the Empire and others were changing. Um, you, you're, you're in a situation where more and more people are moving into the towns. Um, you're getting what Marx called an industrial proletariat. Lots of people living appallingly come to the towns to make more money and have a more interesting life than in the countryside. Um, but being clustered together in appalling circumstances, watching the aristocrats rise, riding up and down the Nevsky Prospect, in their, in, their, in, their, in, their, in their troikas, um, bitter about the fact that they're at the bottom end of society. Um, and so a significant rebellious mood, at least among the intellectual classes, begins to arise. This is, this is, this is from a 1900 um, Russian so, pamphlet. So excuse me, you are I'm in the way. Okay. I will. Yeah. Is, that, is that better? Is that, mm -hmm. I need to be able to see the screen. Does that help a bit? Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, or I can sit down, but I'm slightly worried about people at the back. Yes, but for me, where you are now is fine. I don't know is that okay with everyone? Mm -hmm. Okay. And it shows how the, the, the dispossessed viewed society. You've got at the top the Tsar, you've got uh, the, the immediate courtiers supporting him, you've got the church backing the, the Tsar and backing the ideology of the Orthodox Church, you've got the troops. Who, who sustain the power of the Tsardom, you've got the bourgeois, the people who are doing well out of capitalism, and then you've got the great mass of oppressed Russians underneath. Now, I don't think it really was like that, but that's how it was seen and how it was presented by a very active revolutionary movement. And this sort of resentment and the, the fact that Nicholas himself saw himself as two things. First of all, an absolute autocrat. He had inherited absolute powers from his father and his grandfather going right back to the beginning of the dynasty. And he was not going to surrender those powers willingly. And indeed, even if he'd been willing to, his wife wasn't going to let him surrender them willingly. She was even more of an autocrat than he was. Um, and secondly, he believed the Russian people loved him. He, there's, there's this myth in Russia of the, the sort of a, a, a sacred link between the Tsar and the people. There may be evil people in between, evil counsellors, but the Tsar and the people have some mystical bond. So he saw himself as, as enjoying that bond, as deeply loved by the people uh, and on the basis of rather little evidence. Um, we now arrive at January 1905 when you would have thought that Nicholas was disabused because there was a big, it was a protest march but it was a very civilised protest march. Lots of St. Petersburg's burghers turned out in their best clothes, it was a Sunday, they'd been to church and they came along in a very polite way to present a letter to the Tsar, uh, who actually wasn't in the Winter Palace at the time that they came there, um, putting in requests for more political freedoms, for more economic benefits to, uh, to, to dribble down to the people as a whole. Unfortunately, the Tsar wasn't there, and authority in Petersburg on that day had been left not in the charge of the normal police, but in the charge of the army. Armies are very bad at maintaining civil order, Somebody fired a shot, and that was then followed by a wholesale massacre of the protesters. And at that point, something in the supposed bond between the Tsar and the Russian people snapped. At that point, um, all over the country, 
There were demonstrations, complaints, anger, strikes, a demand for much more political involvement and rights than they had given to that far. And a demand of, at such a volume, at such a level, that Nicholas had no choice but to concede to it. Uh, and he, he, at that point, a, a sort of Russian parliament, or rather limited Russian parliament, called the Duma, was created. It's the first Duma, and you, have to, you probably can't see from out there. But what you're looking at is the Russian aristocracy over here, the people who, of the court, the people who surround the Tsar, and the people who've been elected to the Duma out of villages and towns all over Russia. Poor, sort of straw in their hair, um, ragged clothes, <coughs> and you've got two Russias looking uncomprehendingly at each other, meeting in effect for the first time. There are aristocratic memoirs of the time saying how horrified they are to discover what the other Russia looks like. But you do have a Duma. The elections are fixed so that you get a sort of bourgeois majority in it, you get people who are broadly supportive of the regime. But you do get a lot of lawyers and so on demanding at least some change in Russia. And Nicholas is forced to acquire people around him who can manage <coughs> what is suddenly a slightly bucking horse underneath him. And he finds this man down here, Peter Stolypin, um, who, who be whom he makes prime minister. He's, 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 he's what's known as an authoritarian modernizer, much admired, it has to be said, by Vladimir Putin. Um, he comes in, the first thing he does is he imposes order. <coughs> famous phrase is Stolypin's neckties, which means the gallows. He hangs a lot of, a lot of demonstrators, he reimposes order. But then he sits about reforming, using the Tsar's authority, reforming the economy, beginning to reform the way Russia works in a way to give people more involvement and um, uh, involvement in, in society and the way things work. And it looks for a while as if it's beginning to work, but then Stolypin is actually killed. He's murdered in 1911 in Kiev Opera House, and that effort to reform Russia, to bring Russia out of the old autocracy into a modern state, fails at that point. And one of the questions asked in my book is, if Stolypin had not been murdered, might things have gone better? The answer is almost certainly not, because the Tsar was already losing confidence in Stolypin. There was a whispering campaign against him in the, in, in, in the Romanov court. But that's one of the interesting questions. If Stephen had survived, might Russia have made a civilized transition into modernity? Um, the, the next thing that comes along, so the Dumas there, there are lots of complaints, but things are gradually being dealt with. And then the First World War happens. Now, the Russians um, are, are, have one very striking characteristic, which we, I would say, in regard to our modern policy with regard to Russia, have failed to understand, which is that in a crisis, when there's an external enemy, they gather around and support their government. It's exactly what they're doing with Putin now. And exactly what happened in 1914 when Russia entered the war. There's a huge upsurge of patriotic support for the, for, for the, for the regime. This is Nicholas showing an icon to some of his troops. Uh, and the troops went off cheerfully to fight for, modern, for, for, for Mother Russia. Nicholas, unfortunately... Um, became so enthused patriotically, and the war went so badly because the Russian troops may have been patriotic, but they didn't have boots, they didn't have modern guns, they, they, were, being, they were fighting the best military power in Europe, which was Germany, they were losing, and Nicholas thought that the answer to this was for him to go and personally lead the troops uh, from the headquarters uh, of, of, of the Russian army, which is a place called Mogilev, which is about 500 miles from St. Petersburg. So he goes off to do that. And he leaves in charge Alexandra back in, um, back in St. Petersburg. Alexandra is unfortunately very much under the influence of the mad monk, the monk, Grigory Rasputin, who has acquired the reputation of being able to cure Alexis's haemophilia. Um, and so Alexandra is left in St. Petersburg. She's a German, which isn't good anyway. She's under the influence of this, this rather unkempt monk, which isn't good either. All sorts of salacious rumors fly around. He, Rasputin, is undoubt undoubtedly taking bribes so that people can become ministers. She goes through four prime ministers, five ministers of the interior, three ministers of war, while Nicholas, unknowing, is out fighting the war. And the whole stock, the reputation of the regime, just collapses. Even within the Romanov family, people are saying, this cannot go on. We cannot carry on this way. Um, and the crisis, the first crisis hits in February 1917, which is where we are now. Again, more or less by accident. Um, there's a, an obstacle in bread supplies to the centre of the city, so there's a slight shortage. What happens in regard to a slight shortage? 
those of you who remember the great petrol boot price boosts back in the 1970s, everybody goes out and buys it, so it instantly runs out in all the shops, so then you go from a minor shortage to a massive shortage. That then converts itself into demonstrations. This time, the demonstrations are so bad that the army, instead of opposing them, joins the demonstrators. So suddenly you have a major crisis on the streets of St. Petersburg. Nicholas is called Petrograd, I should say, by now, because we're in the middle of a war, for patriotic reasons. Nicholas is 500 miles away. He tries to come back, but because of the state of the railways, gets stuck in a place called Pskov, and he's in communication by a very inefficient, primitive um, telegraph system with the centre. The man who is in charge in the centre, who is the, um, the, the chairman of the Duma, a man called Ryazanovsky, um, sees the situation, is scared stiff, because the Duma members are respectable middle-class people, but they're surrounded by all of these aggressive troops and workers out on the streets. And um, he says to the Tsar, you must abdicate. There's no other way of calming the situation down. Tsar isn't entirely persuaded by this, but he has one general with him who then goes around and checks with all the other generals around the front. And his reputation having sunk so low, they endorse the advice. The idea is that he abdicates and Alexis becomes Tsar in his place. But Nicholas, dumb to the end, thinks that Alexis is too sick. He cannot inherit the throne. So he suggests another name, his brother Michael. Michael is unacceptable to the vast majority of the people um, in, in St. Petersburg. He's a competent, able, vigorous general. The last person you want to be Tsar if you're looking for transfer of power to the people. So he is refused, and the Romanov dynasty, therefore, again, more or less by accident, ends after 300 years in charge. Nicholas goes off into, pres in, 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 into, um, into captivity with Alexandra and the rest and disappears from history. Um, and Tsar, the, the, the Romanov dynasty is gone and leaves a vacuum in its place. You're now in the, 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 the cockpit, the crucial moments in the revolution between February 1917 and October 1917, where you don't have a properly elected Duma, it's elected on a fixed franchise. You have nothing else. You have the workers who form what they call the Soviet, which controls the streets, which controls a lot of the political power in the city. Neither of those two bodies trusts or even particularly likes the other one. So you have a situation of more or less total chaos with power, available for whoever is best able to grab it. And who turns up? Vladimir Ilyich Lenin. He's been in exile in Zurich. Um, he's a negligible figure, actually. He's an extremist's extremist. He's a socialist of the most extreme kind. He's formed a very small faction called the Bolsheviks. Uh, but he's even more extreme than the Bolsheviks who've been in St. Petersburg through, through, through all of this. The Germans bring him back, of course, in a sealed train because they want people back in, in, um, in Russia who will cause trouble and thereby bring the war to an end. So they send him off in famous, his famous sealed train. He arrives back at the Finland station. He instantly disagrees with all the other members of his party who are looking for sort of compromise style of government, demands that the war end. Peace, land, bread is the, is the slogan that he comes up with. End the war instantly. Give the peasants the land of their landlords. Feed the people. And he just repeats this and repeats this. He overruled, and his first speech is so... Uh, inflammatory, that his own party, the Bolsheviks, don't publish it. They refuse to put it in Pravda. Uh, but gradually he begins to win people over in his own party, and then more widely, and gain greater and greater control of the Petersburg streets. But Petersburg is in a state of pretty much anarchy, and there are two major efforts to... I mean, the, the formal government is the so-called provisional government, which is formed from the rump of the Duma. The real demand for power is coming from the streets, and the Duma has no real control over the streets. Twice, the Bolsheviks launch attempts to seize power from the provisional government. First of all in April, more or less straight after Lenin arrives, which fails totally. Then again in July, which this is the picture of, in a more comprehensive way. But again, they are overthrown, they are stopped by regular troops, <coughs> by the, the regular authorities. And at this point, it looks as if the authorities are going to stamp down on Lenin. He's forced back into exile. A lot of Bolsheviks are arrested. Um, a, a man called Kerensky takes over as head of the provisional government. And Kerensky, looking around for military support, finds this man, Lava Kornilov, who's a very senior general, and does a deal with him under which Kornilov, Kornilov will impose uh, authority on behalf of the provisional government. Uh, and Kerensky will then continue to lead Russia. In particular, Russia will remain involved in the war. Unfortunately, this is another of the great might have been in, in this revolution, somehow Kerensky comes to believe that Kornilov is plotting to take over, is plotting to kick him of Russia. The great 
picture, historical picture, history dominates this, that they have in their memory that they have, is of the French Revolution. The great fact that they have in their minds is that the French Revolution started off with all this liberty, egalitarian fraternity stuff, and ended up with Napoleon. And they are determined that their revolution, this time, will not end up in the same way. And in fact, Kerensky decided that Kornilov wanted to be Napoleon, had him arrested, which meant that he instantly sacrificed all of the military support that he needed for the, for the provisional government to stay in power. Lenin sneaks back quietly. There's a wonderful story here. Um, and we're now into the 24th, 25th of October, 1917. There's a big debate going on among the socialist parties about taking over power from the provisional government, but taking over together. Lenin hates this idea. He wants the Bolsheviks alone to take Russia, to take over Russia. So he sneaks across St. Petersburg from where he's staying to the Smolny Palace. This is the Tarawai Palace. Do I mean the Smolny Palace? Doesn't matter, anyway. It is the Smolny, to the Smolny Palace where all the meetings are taking place. In a disguise, because he's a wanted man, of course. He's come back illegally. He is stopped by a, a police patrol who don't recognise him and wave him on his way. He gets to the Smolny. He, the Bolsheviks are there trying to do the deal with the, with the other socialist power parties, which would have meant a big uh, coalition would come into power. Bullies them out of doing the deal and bullies them into going instantly for power just by the Bolsheviks themselves. And this is the famous... 24th, 25th, the, the attack on the Winter Palace, all of which was a great deal less dramatic than, than, than pictured there. There was no breaking down of the gates or any of that. By the time they got to the Winter Palace, towards the end of the 25th of October, everybody had gone, except for a few women troops who sort of joined in the carousing with the men who wanted to raid it. Within about an hour of being there, they discovered the Imperial wine cellars, whereupon all serious politics stopped for about three days as they all got completely plastered. But the, 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 the myth is, of course, they seized the Winter Palace, they seized power, and there's a kernel of truth to that myth. They did lay their hands on the big levers, although it took them a few more days and weeks to, to gain complete control of it. Meanwhile, I have to mention this because this is my chapter in the book, one of the things that's been going on in the background is that because the provisional government had no democratic legitimacy, the Soviet had no democratic legitimacy, there were discussions and negotiations and preparations for the election of a so-called constituent assembly, which was going to be a democratically elected body, uh, which was going to then take over authority in, in, in St. Petersburg and in Russia. Uh, and this it, it is a tragedy, really, that it just took fantastically long time to do this. In France in, in 1780 or so, and in uh, Germany in, 1740, in, 19, in 1848, where they had a similar uh, challenge, they did it in a couple of months. In Russia, having started the process in, uh, in February 1917, they didn't actually get to holding elections for the Constituent Assembly until November 1917, I, after the Bolsheviks had taken power. The Bolsheviks couldn't stop it. There was too much political weight attached to it, so the elections took place. The Bolsheviks duly lost, they got about a quarter of the votes. Other socialist parties got a lot more. The assembly then gathered in January 1918 um, in, in the Tauride Palace this time, the idea being that it would now take over authority. What the Bolsheviks had done was irrelevant. Uh, but the Bolsheviks surrounded the building with guards. They had all the instruments of, of authority were now in their hands. They let the debate go on for a while. They then um, the, the, the leading Bolshevik was present, went up to the chairman and said, you must close this session now, the guard is tired, and they were all up there pointing their guns at the people below. So Russia's first ever democratically elected, properly democratically elected assembly disperses, they come back the next day to continue their discussions and all the doors are closed. That's the end of that moment uh, of possible democracy in Russia. Um, and again, it's one of those great might have been moments. If they had managed to get this assembly together before October, then its likelihood of achieving something was greater. So now, everything is in the hands of the Bolsheviks. They've taken power in Petrograd, but there's still the whole rest of the country that they have to take control of, and their, their authority is not recognised or understood by the majority of the people. In particular, this lady, Fanny Kaplan, uh, who's a different sort of socialist from the Bolsheviks. Do you think we should close and cut off the... Some there, that? Um, having seen what's happened, she takes a shot at Lenin in August 1918. If she had missed, it would have been just one of those things and nothing would have happened. If she had killed him, then history would undoubtedly have taken a very different course because Trotsky would have inherited from, from Lenin. But she wounds him badly. 
So we don't get Trotsky. We don't get, you know, just another of those events. What we get is an excuse for a huge act of repression and purge. This is the moment when the Red Terror begins. This is the moment when uh, Lenin creates the so-called Cheka, which is the ancestor of the NKVD, the KGB, currently the FSB, the famous Russian secret police. This is Felix Dzerzhinsky, the man who founded the, the Cheka. Astonishingly, this statue is still standing in Petersburg. Um, he's a man who takes charge of it, who makes it work. He gets notes from Lenin saying, why are we killing these people privately? Shouldn't we be doing it in public to, to demonstrate what we're up to to the others? How can you have a revolution without firing squads? There's another myth about the Russian Revolution that it was all going fine and Lenin was a, quite a civilised guy. And it was Stalin. But under Stalin it all went wrong. That is nonsense. Lenin, the Red Terror flowing from the assassination attempt on, on, on Lenin was very much Lenin's work. So that instrument of communist control becomes very real at this point. There is a civil war raging in the rest of the country as the whites, so-called, the people who are disaffected, the old aristocrats, um, find ways of fighting, and there's a genuine war, actually, find ways of fighting against the Bolshevik regime. But because the Bolshevik regime is at the centre of Russia, because its programme is supportive of the peasants in the way that old white generals cannot be, they are defeated, they all hate each other as well, which doesn't help. Um, um, so they, they, they never get coordinated. The Trotsky, who's running the operation at the centre, is able to pick them off one after another. So again, a moment, a moment of possible ending of this uh, is lost. These are various posters from the time. They're, they're, these are the generals down here, Dan Dinikin, Kolchak, Udenich. Uh, some great, great stuff there. And there you are. You come to, Lenin dies actually in 1924, but by then the system is in, is in place. It is based on terror. It is based on total control of the Soviet Union. That is the end of the revolution, which started so hopefully way back in 1905, or certainly in 1917. Okay, that's the 1917 re revolution. How am I doing for time? Right, we're going to have to speed up. Okay, we now move on to the 1991 revolution. So we, we, we shoot on from 1924, or whatever it is, to, uh, let me say, 1985, 1984, 1983. Late, late USSR. They've done brilliantly for a while. They've industrialised the country. They've defeated Hitler and all of that. But... The, the, the speed of their progress, I'm sorry to impose a graph on you, but I'm an ex-mathematician, you have to have one graph, right? Uh, you can see that in competition with the West, they're just running steadily further and further behind. It is not a great economy, it is very badly run. One of the chief conclusions, I think, from the whole Soviet experience is that the market works better than the state for most economic purposes. Um, another way in which they've gone wrong, this is the Russian troops rolling into, into Afghanistan in 1979. A hopeless war, as we Brits discovered late in the 19th century, and as others, including the Americans, have discovered since. You don't invade Afghanistan. They did. They were promptly on a losing war, known as Russia's Afghanistan, which sapped the vitality and popularity of the regime at home. And the other thing about the regime was they were all garotocrats. They were all people who'd been involved in the, uh, the, the revolution way back, and were still somehow around, but were by now very, very old. And they began dying in embarrassing numbers. Brezhnev, who came in in 1964, dies in 1982. He's replaced by Andropov, who's a sort of a reformer, but he then dies in 1984. And Chenenko, who replaces Andropov, inherits in 1985. They were all very old. George H. Bush was sent along by Reagan to these funerals to represent the United States. Uh, and after the second one, he said to the people he was there with, see you next year. And he was right, of course. So you have a regime which feels old, which feels as if it's decaying, which feels as if it's lost its vim and vigour. They need someone who's going to reintroduce the vim and vigour. And so the man they find is Mikhail Gorbachev, who, and again, there's a big misunderstanding here, a, he's a true believer. He's a Leninist. He doesn't want to overthrow the system. He wants to make it work better. And he sets about, the normal way they, they try to make the system work better is what's called uskorenie, a bit more discipline, make vodka more expensive, you know, demand more of the workers in the factories, but it doesn't work because it's very hard to get that to run down the chains of command in the state-run economy. Gorbachev very quickly has an object lesson in how badly the system works. When Chernobyl blows up in April 1986, which is an act of combined administrative, technical and political incompetence of enormous scale, he himself doesn't learn that the explosion has taken place until about a week after it's happened. That people are lying to each other all the way up the chain of command. And at that point, he becomes determined that to reform Russia, you can't do it from the top down. You have to get the people from below to demand reform. You have to get people 
you know, knowing what's going on, knowing the corrupt bureaucrat, knowing the inefficiencies in the factory, and bringing that knowledge to bear in making the country a better place. So he introduces Glasnost, which is a little bit of, you know, you free up the press a bit, you free up the economy a bit, you allow people to form their own cooperatives. I used to, I got a number of oligarchs when I was in, um, in Moscow as ambassador, and I asked one of them how it got started, and he said, you know, I found a little cooperative washing windows, that's what me and my friends did on, on, on Saturday mornings, and we made a little bit of money doing it. And then suddenly, the big state building with lots of plate glass, glass windows on the other side of the road, which had never had its windows washed since it had been built, because the, the system didn't provide for that sort of thing, suddenly came along and said, can you do ours? And from that point, he was a made man. It was by providing those sorts of services, which had not been available, that suddenly a new class of so-called oligarchs emerged, and a new class of people complaining about the system emerge, underlining its deficiencies. And the, 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 the reform path suddenly becomes difficult. It's easy enough to open things up, but suddenly you have two camps in the government. In the government. You have the traditionalists, the people who understood how communism worked, who benefited from it, who don't want substantial change, who fear it. And you have radicals, and here's one of them, Boris Yeltsin, uh, demanding faster saying, this has been awful. We really need to change things much, much faster to make things good, to catch up with the West and all of that. And Gorbachev caught in the middle. He knows that if he goes too far in the directions of the radicals, the traditionalists will, um, will overthrow him, finally, uh, because they include all of the security sector. They include the army, they include the KGB. He knows, however, that if he doesn't go somewhere in the, tradition, in the direction of the radicals, um, then the system remains unreformable because of the huge roadblocks in the way. And things just go horribly, horribly wrong. The economy, you can't run a half-state economy. Either it's state or it's not. So the shop's empty uh, as the state organisations find other places to sell their wares without going through the normal chains. So this top picture here from, um, from Siberia, clear. that's a bread queue. There are bread queues all over Russia. Strikes, suddenly informed, everybody's informed about whatever else is being paid. The miners in the Donbass, this is these people here, go on strike. They want more money for their very hard, dirty work that they're doing. And the other, and finally the fatal thing that happens, is the other bits of the Soviet Union, the Baltic Republics, Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, and Ukraine, and other bits, say, we're not Russian at all. We don't want to be part of the Soviet Union. You're making us free, make us totally free. Let us break away. And that demand, of course, is anathema to the security class, the breakup of the, of the whole country. Nevertheless, the, the downward slide continues. The next thing that happens, 1989, Gorbachev is so preoccupied about trying to keep Russia together that he loses interest in, in the, the outer empire, as it was called, and Poland's, the Hungary's, and all of that. Um, and they, we all remember this day. This is the Berlin Wall opening up uh, in November 1989. They all throw off communism and become free, the free, lovely countries we know, we know them as now, thus further alienating, from Gorbachev's point of view, his own army, his own secret police, who watch their state gradually being weakened and diluted. Indeed, they get so angry that in August uh, 1991, they launch a coup uh, against Gorbachev. He's locked up in his dacha in, uh, in, 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 in um, Crimea. They, they take over. They, 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 their aim is to go for a better yesterday. They want to take things backwards. The only thing that stops them, because these people have organized coups all over the world, they, you know, Budapest and Warsaw, wherever, they ought to be quite good at it. But they actually turn out to be pretty incompetent because they don't lock, there's Yeltsin in the middle there, they don't lock him up. Uh, he comes to the White House, which is where the Russian, uh, the, the Russian Supreme Soviet, the Russian parliament is centered. Get the, 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 the troop, the, um, the coupists have sent tanks there to occupy the parliament and finish off what they're doing. Yeltsin turns up, stands on a tank, says to the Russian people, and astonishingly, some of the news organizations are still functioning, we're not going to have this. We're not going to go backwards. Stand up against the coupists. He is assisted by various, among them, friends of mine, wandering around among the tanks lower down, dishing out quantities of $100 bills to the medium, medium level officers who are there, saying, come on, back off, guys. Whereupon they do. And the coup collapses in ignominy. All the leaders of the coup end up in jail. Gorbachev comes back, but Gorbachev has now lost all authority. He's seen as not having stood effectively against the old, hard line of people. Um, and the man who's gained authority, of course, is Yeltsin. Now, Yeltsin's political position is not a Soviet position as a whole, not in the USSR as a whole. He's president of Russia, the Russian Republic of the old Soviet Union. 
So what Yeltsin is doing, Yeltsin is very keen to acquire power for himself and to reform Russia, is to, in effect, break up the Soviet Union, to take complete control of Russia, and then to reform Russia. And these pictures on the top, famous scene in the Supreme Soviet of Yeltsin telling Gorbachev what to say, what to do. A very visible demonstration of the way power has moved. The picture at the bottom, of course, is the red, uh, um, the red Soviet flag coming down and the white, blue and red Russian flag coming up. The moment of transition. This is the so-called Bielovezhskaya um, Pushka, which is where the final deal was done between Yeltsin over there on the right, and the leaders of Ukraine and Ukraine and Belarus signing away, in effect, Soviet unit, unity. This is the moment when the Soviet Union collapses, and indeed it now breaks up into, I can never remember how many, 15, 16, 17 independent states. Um, 15, thank you. <laughs> um, and this has been driven, as I say, partly by Yeltsin, who wants an independent Russia, but a lot of the stuff that's been behind it, was behind the decision to go for the coup, has been demands for independence from all these states who now get what they want. Still a great start for the new Russian state. This is a picture taken from, in effect, my window when I was working in the embassy in Moscow the first time. This is the Kiev station, which was more or less on the other side of the road from where we were. And what you saw there every morning was old ladies coming to sell their most treasured possessions, to sell their family photographs, to sell their, their silver, what have you, simply in order to buy bread. The economy is now in total free fall. My other memory of this time is in the British Embassy, we have a very big square at the back of Bolotnaya Plasha, about a mile, I would guess, all the way around. And every morning when I came in, um, there would be a queue all the way around that square, leading up to the back door of our embassy, of Russian, with places in the queue being sold by the Mafia, um, of Russians who wanted a visa, who wanted to get out. The country's morale and standing was at absolute rock bottom. And this led to another round of political bloodletting. This is the White House again in 1993, when the communists, who are still in control of the parliament, resist Yeltsin, try to impeach him. Yeltsin's only answer to it is to send the troops in to, to, to throw them out. This is Russian democracy getting off to a pretty bad, rocky start. And it gets an even, even rockier continuation. The big election in 1996, where, where Yeltsin is re-elected and his new constitution is introduced, he starts off with, as you see over there, about 8% popularity, if you look at the graph. Um, everybody is expecting, I mean, this, is, this is Yeltsin on the stage, by the way, dancing on the stage drunkenly with some, some go-go girl. Um, and he, he had really rather lost, I met him a couple of times at this stage, and he was not very engaged in the process of governing. He was looked after carefully by the people around him. And this is time of the time, Russia, back to the USSR. Is it all going to slide away? Now somehow, and it's best not to inquire quite how, Yeltsin's popularity does get up from that 8% up to 27% and he wins the election. But an awful lot of money was spent, an awful lot of arms were twisted. I was in Kazan for one of the days of that election and the newspapers were full of dire warnings to the supervisors of electoral centres that their electoral centres had better produce the right sorts of results. So this, in a sense, Russian democracy, as we have it now, is the product of a poisoned well. At the beginning, the choice was between clean democracy and communism coming back, or something much, much dirtier. And I leave it to those of you who are interested in abstract political philosophy to choose between those two choices, as the Russians had to. And they chose the dirty approach because communism coming back in their view, and I think rightly, would have been an absolute catastrophe. Meanwhile, the West is not being very helpful. Uh, while all this is going on, we do two things. First of all, we expand NATO. Now, in the Russian mind, NATO is the enemy. NATO is the alliance which has threatened their security for the past 40 years, which is a challenge to them. We, I, I put this in pejorative language, but in effect, we see that suddenly there's a big empty space in the middle of Europe where Poland and the Czech Republic and Hungary are, and we grab them. And move them to our sides of the alliance. The way to look at this picture, in a way, is to look at it from this end of the map. Moscow's there. Uh, and what you are looking at is the West moving 500 miles closer to you. The Western Alliance moving 500 miles closer to you. So that's one thing we do, which is discouraging or off-putting for the Russians. The other thing we do is we launch our war in Kosovo. Uh, we don't go to the UN Security Council because the Russians would have vetoed it if we had. Um, Serbs, very close friends of the Russians, we sweep 
um, Milosevic chose power, very nasty man. I don't think that they, they're among the Russians, that they're being humiliated, they're being neglected, they're, they're being, their interests are being thrust aside by a triumphalist West. And they look around for a way of tackling these problems. Now, this is what I'm going to... Did anyone have a thought on how Russia deals with difficult problems historically? When it finds itself in a complete mess, what emerges in Russia? A strong ruler. I've seen it again and again. Ivan, Catherine, Peter. And him, Vladimir Putin, pops up out of more or less nowhere in the middle of 1999 as head of the, of the FSB, it's called now, the KGB, a former KGB, KGB chick. Quiet, effective bureaucrat, loyal to uh, Yeltsin, pardons Yeltsin for all the sins that he and his family might have committed when he, when he becomes president. Um, the search for Yeltsin's successor was described from inside the Kremlin as looking for a Russian Pinochet. The man they found was Putin. The situation he was inheriting was horrific. The economy was a total mess. The mafia were controlling the streets. Bits of Russia, notably Chechnya, were trying to break away. The oligarchs controlled the economy and were not in control of the political system. The press had gone completely mad in hostility to, um, to, the, way Russia was, to, to the way the Kremlin was behaving. And Putin sets about dealing with these problems. Um, Chechnya, top picture, he basically bombs Grozny Flat, the capital, puts a very nasty dictator, a man called Kadyrov, in charge of the place, whereupon Chechen, the Chechen mm -hmm. challenge to Russian integrity vanishes. Um, the oligarchs, this is Mikhail Khodorkovsky, Russia's l richest man for a while, running r Russia's largest company, UCOS. Um, tell Putin gets together with the oligarchs and says, look, guys, you can keep your money, but don't, but stay out of politics. And all but one of them says, yes, sir. The one who doesn't is Khodorkovsky. So he then finds himself arrested on his private plane in the middle of Siberia. He spends eight years in jail and is now leading in, living in exile. And the upshot, of course, is that all the other oligarchs are reinforced in their view that they're not going to get involved in politics. And this man down here is Boris Berezovsky, of whom some of you may have heard, leader of a major press combine in, in, in Russia, in Moscow, very hostile to Putin. He believes that he helped to bring Putin to power before turning against him, but then does turn against him. And Putin, he now lived for a long time in, in, in exile in, in London, having been kicked out by Putin. His banner there, of course, says, I created you and I will destroy you. But actually, it was the other way around. So these are not techniques that I would recommend, but by this set of techniques, Putin imposed what we now think of as Putinism. And you need to understand that a very a magical word in Russian political thought is the word poryadok, order. Regularly, Russians surveyed, asked if they would like more freedom or more order. Vote for order. And Putin, for all of the evil things that have happened, has given it to them in spades. So we end this sequence, just as we had Lenin lives at the end of the last revolution. Putin lives, there he is, absolutely dominant. I was saying earlier, I was going to talk at York, I saw a few minutes, yes, uh, at York on Monday this week, to a room full of university students there, 20, 21, 22 year olds. And I sort of, it occurred to me some way through this talk that these are, you won't mind the word kids, um, who know virtually no other Russia but Putin's. Putin has been there now for 17 years. I kind of think of him as a Johnny Come Lately because I knew Russia before he arrived. But actually, he is the central political fact in how Russia is and how Russia behaves. And as we in the West think of ourselves as having a problem with Putin, we are wrong. We have a problem with Russia. He exemplifies and speaks for, I'm afraid, Russia, what Russia wants. What Russia, Russia wants respect and it wants order. Okay, so those are the two revolutions. Um, and I'd like to just finally, and I will be quick because I'm going to have a couple of questions, reflect a little bit on taking the two cases together. What do they suggest about the complexities or the interesting features of Russian governments? And I would offer you four. Firstly, that actually governing Russia is a pretty fragile business. In each case, you started off with a regime which was pretty tatty around the edges, Nicholas on the one hand and late communism on the other hand, but everybody believed was going to be there forever. The Romanovs had been there for 300 years. I was in the Foreign Office in, uh, in, in, in 1991, and everybody was absolutely convinced that communism would rot. It was rotten, of course. 
and, and uh, upper Volta with rockets, we used to call it. But, um, it, you know, it had enough organizational stability to last for a long time yet. And yet both of them fell in a matter of months with astonishing speed. And that says something quite interesting about how Russian governors view where they are. You're in a pretty opaque situation. Links between the ruler and the people are pretty poor. Um, and as I watch the Putin regime now, which I think is pretty stable, nevertheless, you see them constantly looking over their shoulders, worrying about what might be going on under the carpet. So first point, I think, brought out by both revolutions, you can feel strong and stable, but in Russia, there's often something going on underneath which you're not ready for when it hits you. Um, my second point is about having an empire. Um, in both cases, a large destabilizing element which brought about the outcome which we got to were the states which were controlled by Russia, not by Russia itself. I didn't really bring this out in my account of the 1917 revolution, but a lot of what kept Russia in the war was the fact that Ukraine in particular, but the Balts as well, were occupied by the Germans and were very happy being occupied by the Germans. And the Russians were determined that they would get them back. And so staying in and continuing to fight for that sort of stuff gave the revolution more legs. And of course, this, in, in, the, in the 1991 case, it was the demands for, um, demands for independence from exactly the same list of culprits, from the Ukrainians and the Balts in particular and the Georgians, saying, we don't want to be part of Russia, Russian Empire anymore. Well, you may call it the Soviet Union, we know it's the Russian Empire still. Um, and then that was what finally brought about the Belovetskaya Be deal and the final collapse of the Soviet Union. That's the second point. Having, there are these states around Russia which the Russians regard as naturally being part of them, but which do not regard themselves as naturally being part of the Russian political space. And it's that mutual misunderstanding which is a lot of the problem currently in Ukraine in particular. Um, the third point I would make about the parallels between these two, these two revolutions is that they both started off, if you think about it, very Western-oriented. <coughs> Marxism was a Western creed, invented by a German economist, for goodness sake. It was all about making life better for the common man. It was going to be part of worldwide revolution. We were all going to be brothers together in the communist utopia. We loved the Germans and the, even the Brits and the French, or maybe even the French. Um, and we were working to, to improve our relations with them. And then as we had our revolution in, 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 in Petrograd, in, in Russia, and they didn't, and then they turned hostile, suddenly what had been intended to be a sort of Western-feeling, modernising revolution saw the new regime moving back behind the ramparts, setting up a, a hostility to the West, a picture of the West as enemies and encirclers and uh, underminers, exactly as uh, that had happened so many times before in Russia. And if you look again at the um, 2000 and... The, the, yeah, 2000, I'm, losing, I'm losing myself here. The 1989, 1991 revolution, you start off with a profoundly Western-oriented movement. We want to be normal Europeans. We're going to tear down the statue of Zezinski on Lubyanka Square outside the old KGB headquarters. We're going to open our borders to the West. We close down all our listening stations in Cuba and elsewhere. Um, we're, we're the first guy on the phone when uh, Al Qaeda strike in, in, on 9-11. We, we, you know, we, we want close relations. We want, we want Western money. We want Western mores. We want to be part of the Western way of life. And then you see the West expanding NATO Finding its war in, fighting its war in Kosovo, neglecting Mother Russia, criticising us for things which we obviously had to do, like flatten the Chechens. What business is it of the West's? The Chechens are a, a threat to our, our state. And you see the gap widen. And now, this initially Western-oriented movement has turned into deep hostility to the West, deep suspicion of the West. I said to you earlier, the instinct of the Russian people when they see an external enemy, is to gather around their, their leader. They did it around Alexander I when Napoleon came. They did it even around Stalin when uh, Hitler came. And they're doing it around Putin now. And so we're, in, we're actually in a rather dangerous situation as we are to Russia at the moment. But it reflects the way they have always gone historically when other people take a different view on their own fate to the, the view they take of themselves. And the fourth common feature, and last you'll be released to him, um, about these two revolutions is, of course, they start off as deliberately democratic movements. This is going to be the overthrow of Tsarism, its replacement by 
socialism, brotherhood of man and all that, on the one hand. And on the other hand, um, we, we got rid of communism, we're going to introduce a much more democratic way of government. And inch by inch, as the difficulties begin to emerge, the regime that, emerged, that, that, that comes into power clamps down, makes life harder, becomes more authoritarian, until, in the one case, you end up with Lenin, and in the other case, you end up with um, Putin. Now, I am not saying that Russia is doomed to eternal authoritarianism, but there is something there in the play, way the place works, which means the authoritarian instinct to solve you have a revolution, you're going to be in a horrible state for a long time. And the Russian instinct to look for tough men and tough measures to deal with those problems tends to push you in the direction of authoritarianism. So while they may not be doomed to authoritarianism forever, I think they're doomed for, to authoritarianism for some time to come. Anyway, I hope that was moderately interesting. I'm, I'm, that, that's it. I'm open for questions now. So what was the main difference in his mentality and his approach to ruling? Oh, he became, well, he became angrier, firstly. Um, I arrived in, in 2004, and Russia was, was completely broke at the time, because oil was still very cheap. Um, basically, the internal market operated by bartering between factories. The place was functioning very badly. They got over that, because better order and more rule of law helped to sort things out, but also the oil price rose quite dramatically. Um, and at the same time, they were getting steadily more and more angry at the way the West was treating them. I cited two cases, but the one that happened um, almost immediately when I arrived in 2004 was the Orange Revolution in Ukraine, where again, well, Putin described that as his worst ever foreign policy defeat. And again, a lot of um, the subsequent history of Ukraine reflects his, his determination to reverse what happened then. Um, and what you are seeing now then, by comparison with 2004, and even more so by comparison with 2000 when Putin first came in, is a country which sees itself quite isolated from the West for the foreseeable future, determined not to back down in the face of Western threats and provocation, which you've seen most recently over Syria, where at one rather low point in the crisis in about October last year, they went to some trouble to wheel out a load of Iskander missiles into, onto a base in Kaliningrad to be, to be photographed by US satellites. The point about the Iskander being that it can carry a nuclear, nuclear warhead. Um, so what you're seeing is a Russia which is no, as Putin said actually, in, in his famous speech in, on March the 18th, 2014, after what happened in um, Ukraine, after the seizure of Crimea, um, you push a spring too far and it will push back. And you're seeing the pushback going on now, and Putin is allegedly at the heart of that. And what about 2008? Not as recent as 2014, but rather 2008. Well, he'd already, he gave a very famous speech in 2007 or 6, which was the beginning of the pushback, where he said, he particularly he cancelled a, a, US, a, a European conventional arms treaty uh, and delivered essentially the same message. I'm not going to be pushed around anymore. So that was already coming by 2008. And I, I left in 2008. And we had the Litvinenko case while I was there, which was a, a pretty brazen act of Russian aggression against the UK. Yes, please. I think there are, there's definitely interesting parallels between 1917 and 1991. And I'm just questioning whether 91 would be described as a revolution. I mean, in both cases, you've seen a collapse of a system and a vacuum, power vacuum, and a new regime has, has come into play. But for a revolution, surely you need some sort of driving ideology. It's not just a change of power. I mean, the, the ideology is nationalism for, uh, for, for Putin and backed by him. Yeah. No, you're right, of course, but I had limited time. I didn't want to get into um, <coughs> hair-spitting issues, issues of definition. I think the power, yeah, what you had was a collapse in the system. In one case actually brought out back from the bottom, and the other case brought out from the top. There are lots of differences. You started from a different place, you started from Tsarist autocracy in the one and communist totalitarianism in the other. You ended in different places. You ended with communist totalitarianism in, in, in 1917. You ended with a sort of 
what's, what's called managed democracy, I guess is the best way to describe the current Russian system. But nevertheless, I think the parallels, the collapse of political power, and the way deep Russian instincts re-emerged in the course of that collapse, I, I, I find that quite, quite, quite interesting. Yeah, I think parallels are Please. You, you have mentioned about something like that uh, Russians are rather hostile now to the Western countries. And <clears throat> if we go back to 19th century, there were two groups, Slavophiles and Westernizers. And one group was very much for Western people, uh, sort of ways of uh, uh, thinking, and the other one, Slavophiles, there were sort of people who were very, took, who took pride in that Russia has some mi mission in the world, that to, to, to give some example, some sort of ideas. So you have the same situation now because there are some people who are in Russia very progressive and they want to have democracy in the style of Western democracy. And there are other people, those perhaps who like uh, Putin, who would rather be, who say we are more for uh, order and for this and we like strong men, we don't want this kind of uh, liberalism from the West. Because I often listen to the programs and they often criticize the liberal, uh, liberalism in, this, in, in the West for the reason that they are they feel that they can carry on with better ways than in the West. So I think there is a conflict that between the Westerners and, and the Slavophiles, <laughs> modern, you're, you're modern Slavophiles. Yeah, you're absolutely right, of course. I mean, the, there is a significant slice of the Russian population. As we saw on the streets in 2011, 2012, and there's big demonstrations in the big cities. And to some extent, we've just seen again the, the demonstrations in support of Alexei Navalny um, a month or so ago. Um, young, educated, urban Russians who want the West, who want you know, what the West has to offer, who want to be part of and linked to the West, which is, which is great. However, um, if you look at the fate of the demonstrations in 2011, 2012, it, it was a mistake to do it in the middle of winter, of course, when it was minus 30, so that's a slight disincentive to demonstrating anyway. But it fizzled out, really. Um, and I, I, I mean, Alexei Navalny, whom I know, whatever he may be, is not a liberal. Um, he's, he's, a, he's a very good guy and a very competent politician, um, but he's also something of a nationalist. And, and th there's a whole lecture to be given on Russia's attitudes to a relationship with, with the West. It goes back a long way. Peter the Great is, of course, thought of as a Westernizer. Mm -hmm. um, but actually, his, his most relevant quote, I always look for the, the emblematic quote when I'm talking about someone, with regard to the West is, we will learn, I'm, I'm, I'm going to bagarize slightly, we will learn from the West and then we will show it our backside. Um, and, and there's this view of the West, I, I, mean, I, I like to put it this way, but there are Russians in the audience who may disagree with me totally, that Russia on the whole feels technologically inferior to the West, but spiritually superior. Mm -hmm. uh, and that tension runs through all of Russian history and all of Russia's relationship with the West. And reflects the politics nowadays. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Okay, I've silenced you. Very good. Thank you very much.